Well, hey, Legacy family. Unfortunately, the roads are still kind of treacherous around here, and so we had to cancel our Wednesday night services, but we didn't want you to miss a thing when it comes to the Bait of Satan series that we've been going through by John Bevere. And so we've got that teaching coming up here in just a few moments, and I just want to say thank you for reaching out and connecting with us online today. I believe that this teaching is going to challenge you and it possesses the potential to heal you as well. So I want you to lean in and listen to all that the Lord wants to speak to your heart tonight. Thank you guys again for joining with us for this teaching on the bait of Satan. Welcome to the bait of Satan session two. Now I've put a title on this one and it's how could this happen to me? exclamation mark and question mark, okay? <laughs> Chapter three of the book, we're talking about the two different categories of Christians that are offended, all right? So if you can put them all in two categories, here they are. Number one, those who have been genuinely mistreated. Category number two, those who think they have been mistreated. Okay, now I'm not dealing with category two. I mean, the people in category two are people that have accurate information and have discerned inaccurately, or they have inaccurate information, and they should not be offended because they were not mistreated. However, I want to talk from this point forward, what if you've been genuinely mistreated? And I think the person in the Bible who should be the first one that we go to is Joseph. Would you agree with that, all right? So let's just review Joseph's life, all right? He is the 11th son of Jacob, and Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. And he has 10 older brothers. And when Joseph shows up on the scene, he's a bit of a tattletale. He tells on his brothers, all right? He's a little bit of a bragger, all right? He's got, he, he's got some character issues here that are causing his brothers to not like him. To make matters worse, his father favors him. Bad thing, fathers, don't do that, okay? So now they're, they just hate him. So one night he goes to sleep and he has this dream that his brothers are going to serve him. He gets up and he enthusiastically shares the dream with his brothers. They don't share in his enthusiasm, okay? They hate him even the more. Then he has another dream, tells him again. Now they are really mad. They're, they hate him, okay? So Jacob sends the, the uh, ten older sons to go and watch the flocks, and they end up having to go a great distance away. And one day he looks at Joseph and says, hey, go see how your brothers are doing. So Joseph's looking all over for his brothers. He finally finds out where they are, and he's approaching them, and they see him coming from the distance with his robe of many colors that stood out everywhere. And they said, okay, let's kill him and see what becomes of his dream. Let's see if he'll ever rule over us if we kill him. So they grab him, they tear off his robe, they throw him into a deep pit. And for those of you who don't know, pit stands for preachers in training, okay? <laughs> and so they, they, put, they put blood on the road. They're going to tell their, their dad that he's dead. They're going to leave him in there to die. But then a little later, they see a, a caravan of Ishmaelites coming down to do some slave trading in Egypt. And Judah, the fourth born, says to his brothers, guys, if we leave him there to die, great, we're rid of him but let's make money off of him. Let's sell him as a slave. He'll be as good as dead. We'll make money. He's gone forever. Whew, good deal. All the brothers go, great deal. So they sell him for 20 pieces of silver, right? Joseph is taken down to Egypt. Now, you have to understand, we Americans don't understand what these guys did to their brother. It is one thing to be born a slave, okay? When you're born a slave, that's the only life you know. It's another thing to be born as an heir to a very wealthy man who has a covenant with God and to have your name and your inheritance stripped from you by your own brothers, sold as a slave, because when you're a foreigner sold as a slave, that means you're going to be a slave the rest of your life, your wife's going to be a slave, your children are going to be a slave. You know, I have gone to mission fields and I have gone to nations where I thought after a week, I couldn't live here. But you know, they've never experienced what we have in the Western world. They don't know what we have. Yeah. That's life to them. It, it'd be like being born, and this is a really bad example, in America and then being sent to a nation where you have nothing. They basically have done the very worst thing that can be done to Joseph other than kill him. So Joseph's brought down to Egypt. He's sold as a slave to Potiphar, who is an officer of Pharaoh. Joseph serves him for 10 years. Now, you have to understand, he's probably hoping that his brothers are going to fess up and he's going to get a rescue from a father. But year after year, no rescue. And he's like, my dad thinks I'm dead and my brothers 
are enjoying the money they made off of me and getting all of my inheritance. And so it's a tough 10 years. Think 10 years. I want you to go back 10 years from right now. That is a long time, okay? 10 years he's serving as a slave in Potiphar's house. Now, he's doing really good. God's blessing him. So he's getting favor with Potiphar and Potiphar finally puts him over all the affairs of his house. But something much worse is starting to brew and that is Potiphar's wife gets the hots for Joseph, okay? She sets eyes upon him and she starts trying to seduce him, not periodically, but every day. She's coming to him saying, hey, lie with me. My husband will never know. And you know what he does? I love his fear of God. He goes, no. No, no, I'm not sinning against God. I'm not sinning against your husband. One day, they're alone in the house. She grabs him by the robe. She says, lie with me. My husband's gone. He says, no way am I sinning against God and against your husband. He flees. He does what the Bible says. He flees sexual immorality. When he does, his robe tears. He runs out of the house naked. She's a scorned woman. She screams rape. Now, when Potiphar comes home, she tells him that he tried to rape her. And so Potiphar throws him into Pharaoh's dungeon. Now, you have to understand something. I have preached in prisons in the United States and even South Africa. Our prisons are country clubs compared to Pharaoh's dungeon. Middle Eastern dungeons were usually hollowed out cisterns deep in the ground where there was no fresh air and there was, it was damp, it was cold, it was dark. And sometimes the ceilings, I've been in a Middle Eastern dungeon, is about this high. And the Bible says they laid his feet in irons and they hurt him in fetters. So this is not a country club experience like our prisons, okay? Where you got TVs and you got basketball courts out there. He's in this place, all right? Now, can you imagine his thoughts? First of all, his thoughts about Potiphar. I can't believe it. I am more faithful to that man than his own wife. And this is what he gives me. This is what I get. What about his thoughts with God? Okay, God. I've done nothing wrong. I just shared the dream you gave me and it gets me slavery. Now I'm sitting there obeying you. I'm being faithful to my Egyptian master for 10 years. And this is what I get, the dungeon. It seems the more I obey you, God, the worse my life gets. In fact, how could his life get any worse? He's not an Egyptian in that dungeon. He is a foreigner. If you're an Egyptian, you may have a chance of getting out. If you're a foreigner and you're a slave and you're accused of raping the officer's wife, they have left you in there to rot. In those dungeons, they would only give you enough bread to live. They they wouldn't give you nice food. You didn't get a three square meal deal or even a two square meal. You got just enough bread and water to stay alive because dying is too easy. They don't want you to die. So he's got all this time to think. Oh, fine, faithful, covenant-keeping God you are. I obey you, and this is what I get. This is called the blessing of the Lord my grandfather talked about. You got to understand, he's lost all of his freedom, but he has not lost his freedom of the way he thinks and the way he processes. He's got a great chance to have some strongholds being built because this is a big offense, okay? He's about as low as a person can go. But it basically comes all down to his brothers. It's all because of his brothers that he's in the shape that he's in. Can you imagine what he's thinking? I mean, here's the thing. If his brothers wouldn't have done what they'd done, he would have enjoyed 10 years in his father's wealthy, wealthy estate. How many times do people fall into this kind of thinking? If it wasn't for my wife, I would be a much better man today, but she constantly criticizes me. If it wasn't for my pastor, I'd be in the ministry today. If it wasn't for that man who gossiped about me, I wouldn't be fired from my job. Here's the thing we've got to understand, and I'm going to give you a truth that I want you to remember. Never forget this. Here's the truth. Absolutely no man, woman, child, or devil can ever get you out of the will of God. No one but God holds your destiny. If you get that truth, you are a free person. I mean, Joseph's brothers literally said this. Look look at their words. They said, come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. We shall see what becomes of his dreams. They intended to destroy any chance of him ever being a leader. Joseph 
could have sat there and thought, it's all because of my brothers I'm in this situation. And he could have been plotting revenge against his brothers. If I get out of here, I'm going to kill him. If that ever comes to pass where I'm a leader, I'm killing him. But you know, if he would have been doing this, and so many people today in the church do this, plot revenge, getting even, paying back. If he would have plotted revenge, God would have had to leave him in the dungeon to rot. Because he would have killed 11, excuse me, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, including Judah, whom Jesus and King David came through. Would you stop and think with me for a minute? Do you think when his brothers did this, God the Father looked at Jesus and the Holy Spirit and said, Whoa! What are we going to do? Oh my gosh, we gave him this dream of leadership. And his brothers did this. Jesus, do you have an alternate plan? I mean, that's ridiculous. But yet, how many times do we act like this? when something happens with us. I mean, we think Jesus, is, Father's looking at Jesus going, Jesus, Sally's 34 and not married. Her best friend gossiped about her and the man we wanted her to marry didn't marry her. Oh, do you have any other available guys down there for Sally? <laughs> Jesus, Jim just got fired. He had a fellow employee who gossiped about him. Oh my gosh, that was our plan A for his life. Do we have a plan B or even C? Is it possible? Does anybody, anybody have an opening down there with Jim's, that fits Jim's skills? Okay, that's ridiculous, right? But yet how many times do we act that way? Okay, like God just got totally shocked by the wrong that was done to me. Okay, we, we, we just nailed it, okay? We exposed it. We are basically saying God is out of control. And my steps are in order of the Lord. You see how ridiculous this becomes? So he's in this dungeon, and we don't know how long. It could have been a month. It could have been a couple weeks. But God brings his greatest test to Joseph. And this is the test. There's two prisoners, a butler and a baker, okay? They were, they were Pharaoh's chief butler and chief baker. They're thrown in the same dungeon, and they come to Joseph. And they said, oh, we each had a dream last night. Now, what is the greatest test of Joseph? The greatest test is, can he proclaim the faithfulness of God to this butler and baker when he hasn't seen one shred of God's faithfulness in his own life for 10 years? Now, I want you to think with me. God gave him a dream. You're going to be a great leader. Your brothers are going to bow down and serve you. He's gone from pit to slavery, to dungeon, and he's left there to rot. The more he obeys God, the worse it gets. It appears God has not been faithful to him. Can he proclaim the faithfulness of God to this butler and baker? You know, if Joseph was like a lot of Christians today, you know what he said? You had a dream? Fine. Leave me alone. I had a dream once. Don't talk to me about dreams. If he would have done that, he would have died in that dungeon a bitter man. Do you know how many people die bitter? Gosh, my heart breaks when I even say that. But yet Joseph looks, he, his fear of God is amazing. He looks at this butler and baker, and he says, God is faithful. And he proclaims to them the interpretation of the dream that the Holy Spirit gives him. The baker gets his head cut off. That's exactly what he said would happen three days later. And the butler's restored. And he looked at the butler and he said, when you get restored, would you please remember me? So the butler gets restored and he forgets Joseph. And he's there two more years. I mean, can it get any worse? Do you understand? I mean, he does not have the book of Genesis to read. Okay? You know the end of this story. You've read it. He doesn't have the narrative. Two years. Would you stop and think how long two years? He's in this dungeon, laid in irons and hurt with fetters and given enough bread and water just to survive. Yet two years later, 
Pharaoh has a dream. The butler says, I have sinned. There was a man who interpreted my dream accurately and the bakers accurately. You know the story. Pharaoh brings him forth. He interprets Pharaoh's dream. He's restored now, made, not just restored, he's made number two in command of all of Egypt, which is the most powerful nation in the world. He tells Pharaoh, there's going to be seven years of plenty, store up. And then there's going to be seven years of famine, right? After two years of the famine, so we're talking about nine more years now. So do you understand? We're talking 21 years since he's had this dream. Two years into the famine, here comes his brothers. What does he do? Oh, you guys. Oh, you guys. You're going to pay for this. No, he doesn't. He blesses them. He gives them their money back without them even knowing it. And look what he looks at his brothers and says. He says, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves. Because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Keep reading. To preserve a posterity for you in the earth. He's talking for their benefit. I was sent here for your benefit. I went through all this suffering for your benefit. And to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now, you may think, okay, Joseph, are you now delusional? (laughs) Out of the mouth of two witnesses, every word's established. Look what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, moreover, God called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provisions of bread. God sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. It was not his brothers, Joseph said, that sent me here. It was God. I want you to look at the statement that I made earlier. Absolutely no man, woman, or child, or devil can ever get you out of the will of God. No one. Except for you. If you remember the children of Israel, God said, you're about to enter into a promised land. It's all yours. I'm giving it to you. This is the land I promised to your fathers. But they got offended with Moses. But they were really offended with God. God said, they're too scared to say they're offended with me, but they really are offended with me. That offense cost them their destiny. It cost them the promised land. So I want you, if you get this revelation, your life will be changed forever. No man, woman, child, or devil can ever get you out of the will of God. The only one that can get you out of the will of God is yourself by becoming offended. Do you see why it's such a trap? David says this, he said, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Everybody say book. book. Do you know there was a book written about you before you were born? And God is the one who wrote it. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. I want to show you Psalm 34 or 37. Look at this. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. I want to read this to you straight from the book. God knows we live in an evil world where people make mistakes and even sin as Joseph's brothers sinned against him. He doesn't cause those people to treat us evil, but he knows what they'll do before they do it. So he uses what they do to bring forth his plan. I imagine it never crossed Joseph's mind until it was all over that it was God's process to prepare him to rule. If you look at Joseph before he went through all of this, he's a tattletale. That's the first thing you hear about him when in Scripture. He, he told on his brothers. His brothers were doing something wrong, and he told on them. He was a tattletale. He was a bit of a bragger. He gets the dream. Hey, guys, come on. I'm going to be your leader. <laughs> that is the stupidest thing to say to older brothers, okay? <laughs> he didn't have a lot of wisdom. He shared his dream with his brothers when he should have kept it to himself and pondered to himself like Mary did when the angel came to her. After he goes through the refining process... <laughs> He doesn't reveal himself right away to his brothers. Now, can you imagine if he would have been like he was before? He said, guys, it's me. See, the dream came to pass. Who was right, boys? Okay, you got it? He doesn't do that. He doesn't reveal himself. He wants to just bless them and bless them and bless them. All right? He acted with humility with his brothers. He didn't remind him that he was in charge now. Not once did he say, I'm the boss. He pointed out to 
that God did this for the sake of their families. It was all about them. Offended people, it's all about me. How badly I've been treated, how wrongly I've been treated, how tough life has been on me. I look at my beautiful mom sitting here. She's 89 years old. My mom's one of the most positive people I've ever met in my life. My mother never complains. And she looks at me yesterday. She's 89. She says, I'm scared of how blessed God has, uh, blessed of a life God has given me. I'm, I'm like, I'm not. Because your focus has always been to give, to give, to give, to give. You've not allowed a fence to enter your heart. Refining processes are important because they prepare us. They give us the character. And many times the way we're refined is through offense. Look what Peter says. This is amazing. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. <laughs> Listen to these words. Greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while. Now, a little while with God. <laughs> okay, let me prove it to you. I'm, I'm kind of got a scientific mind. A day with the Lord's a thousand years. Right? Right? So that makes one hour about 43.2 years. So 15 minutes is seven or eight years. A little while. <laughs> Though now for a little while, if need be, if need be, if you need to be refined. Joseph needed to be refined. Otherwise, if he would have had the character when he was a teenager, when, before they did all that, once he became ruler, he would have destroyed 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. If need be... You have been grieved. It's not a pleasant thing when you go through an offense. Distressed by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it, your faith, is tested or refined by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory of Jesus Christ. I remember I was going through a set of trials that I didn't bring on myself. I didn't do a thing to bring these trials on. And it was so tough that I'll never forget for a six-month time period, there would be times I would close the office door and I'd put my head up against the corner of the wall and i said, God, why do I hurt so bad inside? I said, I'm living in pain. I wake up in pain. I come to, this, I come to office in pain. I go home in pain. I'm living in pain. You know what the Lord said to me? He said, because you're dying. He said, there's always pain and death. And he said, do you want to know how you're going to know when you're dead? I said, how do I know when I'm dead? He said, when you stop hurting. He said, dead people don't hurt. I said, God, please kill me quick. <laughs> so I remember in this time period, and this was a little while later, I was yelling at everybody. I was mad. I was mad at my wife. I was mad at Addison, who's sitting right there. Addison's 30 years old. He was, he was, I think he was six months old at the time or nine months. I'm yelling at Addison. I'm mad at my friends. I'm mad at my pastor. I'm mad at my coworkers. So one day I was heading out to the prayer grounds, and I said, God, where's all this anger coming from? I said, I've never been angry like this before. I've always been such a happy kind of guy. And the Lord said to me, he said, Look at your gold ring on your finger. So I looked at my gold ring, ring finger, my, my wedding ring. It was gold at the time. Lisa's given me a, a new one for our 25th. But it was, it was yellow gold. And he said, does it look like pure gold to you? I said, yeah, it looks like pure gold. He said, but it isn't, is it? I said, no, it's, it's actually 14 karat gold, which means 14 parts out of 24 parts is gold. And 10 parts out of 24 parts is impurities, such as copper, zinc, nickel. He said, but if you put it in a furnace and heat it up to 7,000 degrees, said, he said to me, what happens? I said, it'll liquefy. He said, then what happens? I said, well, the lighter metals, the impurities, which is the copper, zinc, nickel, adhere to the flux that they put in and rises to the surface. He said, they appear, right? I said, yeah, they appear. He said, they were always in there, but not visible to you. I said, yeah. He said, you say, where is all this anger coming from? He said, it's always been in you. He said, and I brought you in the furnace of my affliction, Isaiah 48, verse 10. And he said, this affliction is causing the impurities to come to the surface. He said, now, you can blame your wife, your son, your pastor, your co-workers. And he said, you know what happens? All the impurities will go right back down and we have to start the process all over again. <laughs> or he said, you can say, God, it's all because of me. Take it out. And he said, I'll bring my big ladle and scoop out the impurities so that your heart can become purer so that I can use you in greater levels of leadership. Wow, wow, wow. So, you know, when I was 50 years old, I prayed this prayer. I said, God, 
If there's anything impure in me, burn it out, shake it out, cut it out, do whatever you got to do. Oh, my goodness. I went through the hardest summer of my entire life, the summer I turned 50. And I told one of my pastor friends about it. He said, oh, John, that's what 24-year-olds pray. What are you praying that for? <laughs> I'm 57 now, and can I tell you, I am so thankful that I prayed that prayer because there was a lot more maturity that had to happen with me. In returning to Joseph, the very wicked behavior of his brothers ended up being the pathway to his destiny. I want you to see this before we close. Often the thing that looks like an abortion of God's plan actually ends up being the road to its fulfillment. If, and this is a huge if, I should have made it yellow, we stay, if we stay in obedience and free from offense. Next time you think you're going through something, consider Joseph. See you next session. Man, what a powerful teaching on letting the spirit of offense go and embracing our destiny and all that God has for our life. Friend, whether you're in church or not, the truth of the matter is at some point, somebody's gonna do something to offend you. And it's how you deal with it that determines uh, your outcome. And so today, I just wanna pray with you. If you're struggling in this area, maybe people have done things to you that you've, you're shouldering, and maybe for some of you, you've you've bore that for years and God wants to touch you and set you free from that. And I believe he could do it right now. So let's pray together for just a few moments and I wanna ask the Holy Spirit to heal you and to help you as you process through this emotion. Father, I just thank you for the teaching that we've just heard and the, the life of Joseph and all the encouragement that we can draw from that story. Lord, I pray for my friends tonight that you would heal them, that you would touch them and set them free, God from things that other people have heaped on them. And Lord, I just uh, I ask you that you would help us not to continue that hurt and that pain in our life, but to forgive people and to move forward to the brightness of our future and our destiny and what you have for our life. God, we thank you that you love us enough not to leave us with this baggage and this hurt and this pain festering in our heart. I pray for each friend that's watching this, the power of your spirit set them free, the power of your word, God, to continue to guide them. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the power of freedom that we feel on our lives right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray pray. Amen. Thank you, friend, for joining us for this teaching tonight. Hey, it looks like Sunday's going to be good. Hate that we weren't able to see you face to face tonight, but Sunday's coming soon. Join us 8 30, 10 o'clock or 11 30 for one of our morning services on Sunday. We would love to see you there. God bless you guys.